Hello, welcome to new listeners to the podcast and welcome back if you have been here before. Our story in focus this week is on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent, where ash from a volcano that recently erupted has essentially left the island without water. Among other stories, we'll also touch on news that Japan plans to dump the stored water from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear incident into the ocean. We'll wonder about the ethical consideration behind news that human cells were recently grown in embryos in monkeys. We'll also balance China's road to net zero energy against their decision to build a massive dam as a way to get there. And in one of the more fun, but maybe not so much stories, Amazon has made a decision to cancel its planned Lord of the Rings game. I am your host, Yemi, and every week I bring you overlooked stories from all around the world. As you'll see from this episode, the stories include the good, the bad, the weird, and sometimes even the ugly. With that said, let us get right into the stories for this week with tech news to kick us off. A digital driving license service has been launched in Saudi Arabia, according to the Saudi press agency. With the digital license, all details can be viewed electronically through a QR code. Users can also download a copy of their digital ID and driving license on a smart device for use without an internet connection. The digital license was developed in collaboration with the Saudi Data and Artificial Intelligence Authority and was launched through the Interior Ministry's Absa Individuals and Tawakalna apps. Authorities in Saudi have also launched a digital version of the Muqim, or resident ID, for foreign workers in the country. The Fukushima nuclear incident that happened at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in northern Japan in 2011 was the second worst nuclear incident in the history of nuclear power generation. The incident was instigated by a major earthquake that happened off the coast and initiated a series of large tsunami waves that spread inland and devastated many areas of the country. Reactors at the Fukushima nuclear plant were damaged at the time, and since then, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, has been accumulating the contaminated water in tanks, but storage capacity will likely run out in late 2022. Japan has now announced that it plans to dump more than 1 million tons of decontaminated water from the destroyed nuclear station into the ocean. The actual work to release the water will begin in about two years, according to the Japanese government, and the entire process will take decades to complete. It is a multi-stage process where the water will be filtered and diluted to meet international standards before it is released. The criticism has been swift and strong. It was almost immediately criticized by China's foreign ministry, who called it extremely irresponsible. In a statement on the China's foreign ministry's website, a spokesperson implored Japan to hold back from its plans until it has fully consulted and reached an agreement with all stakeholder countries and the International Atomic Energy Agency. South Korea also raises concerns over Japan's decision with the visiting U.S. climate envoy, John Kerry, who was in Seoul, South Korea. John Kerry reaffirmed Washington's confidence in the plant's transparency. He was visiting Seoul to discuss international efforts to tackle global warming ahead of President Joe Biden's virtual summit with world leaders on climate change, which is scheduled for April 22nd to the 23rd. The Nationwide Federation of Japan Fisheries Cooperatives has continued to express its complete opposition to ocean discharges based on concerns that it will be detrimental for the fish population in the area. Greenpeace Japan has also come out strongly and condemned the decision. By their review, the decision completely disregards human rights and interests of people in Fukushima, wider Japan, and the Asia-Pacific region. According to a poll by the organization, most of the residents of Fukushima and the wider Japan are not even supportive of the government's decision. UN human rights experts also said that the contaminated water still remaining in the nuclear plant poses major environmental and human rights risks 
and any decision to discharge it in the Pacific Ocean cannot be an acceptable solution. While there was no real overwhelming show of support or endorsement from the U.S., they have not necessarily opposed the plans. The former U.S. Secretary of State and current U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry added that Washington will closely monitor Japan's implementation and reinforce his confidence in the transparency of the process, particularly with the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA. Some engineering experts do not believe this plan poses any problem. For example, Brent Hauser, an engineering professor from the University of Illinois, expressed support for the plan. He said Japan's plan to release the treated radioactive water from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear plant will have zero environmental impact. He believes that the filtering process will remove most radioactive elements from the water, leaving only tritium that's not even harmful in small quantities. The IAEA, or International Atomic Energy Agency, said Japan's chosen water disposal method is both technically feasible and in line with international practice. The Director General of the IAEA, Rafael Marino Gaussi, welcomed Japan's announcement, and he said the agency stands ready to provide technical support in monitoring and reviewing the plan's safe and transparent implementation. So, as I usually ask, what do you think? Had you heard about this plan? Did you know water was still being stored in tanks? So, share your thoughts in the comment section of our Facebook page or on Instagram. The link is in the episode show notes. The Caribbean island of St. Vincent is running out of clean water after ash from a volcanic eruption contaminated the island's reservoir. At 4,000 feet tall, active volcano called La Silfriere dominates the largest island, St. Vincent. The volcano has been silent since the year 1979, but it began to spew smoke and started rumbling in December, before erupting on Friday, April 9th, when NASA's Terra satellites measured parts of the plume at altitudes of up to 20 kilometers or 12 meters high. The eruption is creating an escalating humanitarian crisis on the ground. While no casualties have been reported as a direct consequence of the explosion, thousands of people have been displaced and even more are affected across the island as the volcano has continued to rumble. Also, falling ash and pyroclastic flows, which are fast-moving lava, ash, and hot gases, have destroyed crops in addition to contaminating water reservoirs. Up to 2,000 people have had to evacuate the island's northern region in the shadow of the eruption, with 3,000 more forced to move to 80 government shelters. Islands that have said they would accept evacuees include St. Lucia, Grenada, Barbados, Antigua. The Prime Minister, Ralph Gonzalez, has said that he is negotiating with other Caribbean governments to accept ID cards from people who don't have passports. The World Bank has stepped in and given $20 million to the government of St. Vincent as part of an interest-free catastrophe financing program. Here in Canada, the St. Vincent and Grenadines Association of Montreal is accepting donations to support thousands of evacuees. The crisis could keep dragging on. Multiple experts have said that the volcano could keep erupting for weeks. And this eruption patterns are similar to the volcano's 1902 eruption, which eventually killed 1,600 people. Even after the volcano goes quiet, the ash could keep falling and recirculating around St. Vincent and neighboring islands for some time. Right now, the volcano alert level on the island remains at a code red, a high-level state of emergency. History lovers who are visiting Rome in the year 2022, fingers crossed, 
are in for a treat because the historic area Sacra Largordi Torre Argentina is scheduled to be restored in a way that makes it more accessible to visitors. The sunken area is widely thought to be the site of Julius Caesar's murder in addition to containing the remains of four Republican era templates that were all built between the 2nd and the 4th centuries BC. These ruins, which are among the oldest in the city, are off limits to humans but has somehow become the home to a thriving population of around 300 stray cats and a volunteer run cat sanctuary. The cats are fed, sterilized, and cared for by the private nonprofit shelter, and they have made the site their own. In fact, become a tourist attraction in their own right. The renovation will allow visitors to enter into the sunken site to see the ruins of the temples and a circular monument of the goddess of fortune. The work is due to begin shortly and will take a year to complete. The project is co-financed by the Italian fashion company, Bulgari. The city has assured the general public that the renovation will not affect the cats. So, for those who plan to visit, I found it broadly recommended online that you should visit the area at night when the ruins are illuminated with soft yellow lights and are particularly pretty. Human cells have been grown in monkey embryos by scientists from Salk Institute in the U.S. As expected, the announcement has sparked ethical concerns across the globe, with some warning that it opens a Pandora's box. The procedure involved human stem cells, which are special cells that have the ability to develop into many different cell types, being inserted into the embryos of Marque monkeys. It was done in a petri dish in a lab and not directly inserted into the monkey. Chimeras are organisms whose cells come from two or more individuals. Other so-called mixed species embryos or chimeras have been produced in the past, with human cells implanted into sheep or pig embryos. In humans, chimerism can naturally occur following an organ transplant, where cells from the organ starts growing in other parts of the body. The aim of the experiment is to understand more about how cells develop and communicate with each other. Specifically, Professor Juan Carlos Ispoa Belmonte, who is leading the research, said that these chimeric approaches could be really useful for advancing biomedical research, not just in the very early stages of life, but also in the later stage of life. The professor also insisted that their research met current ethical and legal guidelines and also added that the studies are being carried out for an ultimate goal of improving human health. The chimeric embryos were monitored in the lab for 19 days before being destroyed on the 20th. Some experts from the UK have highlighted the significant ethical and legal challenges posed by the creation of such hybrid organisms and called for a public debate. And yeah, I guess that's what we're doing here, right? Let's debate in the comment section. In response to the research, Dr. Anna Smadjor, lecturer and researcher in biomedical ethics at the University of East Anglia's Norwich Medical School, she said, and I quote, that this breakthrough reinforces an increasingly inescapable fact. Biological categories are not fixed, they are fluid. This also poses some significant ethical and legal challenges. She also added that while scientists moved forward with their approach because they were unable to conduct certain types of experiments in humans, the question actually becomes whether these embryos themselves are human or not, and that is an open question. In her view, the key ethical question is, what is the moral status of these novel creatures? Before any experiments are performed on live-born chimeras, or their organs extracted, it is essential that their mental capacities and lives are properly assessed. In the United States, federal funding cannot be used to create certain types of chimeras, including non-human primate embryos containing human stem cells. The new study was performed in China and funded by Chinese government sources, a Spanish university, and a U.S. foundation. Bioethicist Karen Mashke of the Hastings Center in New York says she's satisfied that the work was performed responsibly. 
It passed layers of institutional review and drew on advice from two independent bioethicists. Experiments attempting to combine non-human mammals have taken place since the 1970s, but creating chimeras with human cells is more recent, typically using mice, sheep, and pigs. Back in the UK, Professor Dominic Wilkinson, Director of Medical Ethics at Oxford University's Uherio Center for Practical Ethics, does not necessarily believe that there is anything unethical or ethically troublesome about creating what he calls these clumps of cells that are being studied to understand more about the early stages of embryo development. While he cited religious views as one example of why many oppose embryonic research, Professor Wilkinson likened the new research to, and I quote, some early gene therapy experiments, such as work on human cloning and test tube babies, which led, which led to further reflection on what further development of these ideas would ethically entail. The debates on gene therapy ultimately led to vastly different outcomes, and while a general consensus emerged that human cloning should be avoided, in vitro fertilization was essentially born. In his view, and I am paraphrasing, while many people were uncomfortable at the time with IVF, it has become more broadly accepted and has helped a lot, a lot of people across the world. So, what do you think? Pandora's box, slippery slope, no worries, keep calm and carry on? Share your thoughts on the social media page. They asked for a debate, right? Let's do that. In the foothills of the Himalayas, where the ancient Yaolong civilization established the Tibetan Empire, China now has plans to build the world's biggest hydroelectric dam. In November last year, China's state-owned media shared plans for a 60-gigawatt mega dam on the Yaolong Tsangpo River in the Tibetan Autonomous Region, or TAR. From its origin in the glaciers of western Tibet, Yaolong Tsangpo River reaches heights of nearly 5,000 meters or 16,404 feet above sea level, which makes it the highest river in the world. The river then plunges 2,700 meters or 8,858 feet through what is known as the Yaralong Tambo Grand Canyon, forming a gorge that is more than twice the depth of the Grand Canyon in the United States. The precipitous fall makes it particularly conducive to collect hydroelectric power, but experts have now warned that the record-breaking dam is likely to have both political and environmental consequences. The river plays a pivotal role in China's plan to be carbon neutral by 2060. Once complete, the dam will be able to produce 300 billion kilowatts of electricity each year. Three times the electricity generated by the Three Gorges Dam, which is currently the world's largest power station. These plans have stoked fears among environmentalists and in neighboring India. The structure is expected to span Brahmaputra River before the water leaves the Himalayas and flows into India. The dam is also mentioned in China's strategic 14th five-year plan that was unveiled in March, but there weren't a lot of details about the plan itself, the time frame, and the plan budget. Environmentalists also opposed the Three Gorges Dam that was built between 1994 and 2012. The Three Gorges created a reservoir and eventually displaced 1.4 million inhabitants who were upstream. According to Brian Ayla, an energy, water, and sustainability program director at the Stimson Center, which is a U.S. think tank, building a dam of this size was a bad idea and is a bad idea for many reasons, including seismic activity, the unique biodiversity in the area, and the possibility that it would block the migration of fish, as well as sediment flow that enriches the soil during seasonal floods downstream. There are both ecological and political risks, which was noted by Tempa Gyalsten Zamila, who is an environmental policy specialist at the Tibetan Policy Institute, which is a think tank linked to the Tibetan government in exile based in India. Zamila expressed concerns that the dam will destroy the rich Tibetan cultural heritage in the area in addition to ecological damage, 
Furthermore, there are concerns that many residents will be forced to leave their homes to make way for the mega project. India is also worried about the project. China is effectively in a position to control the origins of much of South Asia's water supply. This leaves the potential for a water war, where China could leverage its control of such an essential natural resource against neighboring countries. In reaction to the dam idea, the Indian government has floated its own prospect of building another dam to shore up its own water reserves and essentially hedge its risk. This is an interesting developing story and the idea of a water war isn't something I had really thought about or ever really considered. And this certainly brings it to the top of my mind. The idea that water can be used as a form of leverage because one country essentially controls the source where the water comes from. Is that something you've ever thought about? I never have. And it will be interesting to take a deeper dive and see where that has occurred in the past and how that turned out as a leverage tool. Citigroup plans to exit retail banking in 13 markets across Asia, Europe, Middle East, and the Africa region. The date has not been announced yet. The 13 countries are Australia, Bahrain, China, India, Indonesia, South Korea, Malaysia, the Philippines, Poland, Russia, Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. Oof. This means that individuals who are currently holding Citibank accounts will lose their personal accounts or cards with the bank once it comes into force. The bank will instead operate its consumer banking franchise in both regions from four well centers in Singapore, Hong Kong, the United Arab Emirates, and London. The New York-based bank said it will continue to offer business products and services to its institutional clients in affected markets, including trading, private banking, and investment banking. CEO Jen Frazier said that the move was strategic, and while the affected markets had excellent businesses, the scale necessary to compete was just not there. The company believes that its capital, investment dollars, and other resources would be better deployed against higher returning opportunities in wealth management, as well as in institutional businesses in Asia. Two hackers from Indonesia were arrested in Surabaya, East Java, for allegedly creating fake websites in a scam to collect COVID-19 relief funds from the U.S. government. The alleged scammers stole the funds that were allocated for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, or PUA. Through the PUA, the U.S. government had set aside $2,000 for each citizen. In total, it is estimated that the scam has reportedly cost the U.S. government about $60 million. Articles did not share the names of the suspects. Instead, they were identified using initials. The initials were SFR and MZMSBP. Both of them were caught after an investigation by the East Java Police, the National Police, and the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations, popularly known as FBI, looked into the case. The East Java Police Chief, Nico Afienta, said that the scam website was created to look like the official websites created by the U.S. government for American citizens affected by the pandemic. To get traffic, the website address was sent randomly to millions of Americans through an SMS blast. At least 30,000 Americans fell for the scam by clicking the link included in the message. Once they clicked the link, like with most of these scams, they were promptly asked to fill out personal information, including their social security numbers. The suspects reportedly reinvested the money into their criminal enterprise and used it to buy a variety of more sophisticated equipment for future scams. The authorities are still looking into the possibility that they did not work in a vacuum and that there were other parties, including foreign nationals, who may have been involved. SFR and MZM SBP have been charged with financial fraud. They could be put in prison for up to nine years and or given a fine of up to of up to $206,000 if convicted. Remember that many scams and fraud attempt to imitate government services in order to gain access to your personal and financial information. Remain vigilant. Some resources have been included in the blog for information on scams. At the end of the day, if it sounds too good to be true, or even too bad to be true, it probably is. 
In our last story tonight, we are going to go over to Amazon. Amazon's planned Lord of the Rings video game has now been cancelled, according to Bloomberg. According to Bloomberg, in 2019, Amazon's gaming division announced that it was developing a Lord of the Rings game in partnership with China-based Lei Yu Technologies. But after Lei Yu was bought by the gaming behemoth that is Tencent in December 2020, it appears that the plans have, um, you know, fallen through. This is not the fa- this is not the first gaming related cancellation from Amazon. It has canceled every high profile game in development at some point, such as Breakaway and Crucible. It appears that the New World would likely be the studio's first release when it hits in August 2021. So, fingers crossed for them. It also looks like members of the team who had been working on that project will be moved to other projects. So, for those of you who are looking forward to the game, that sucks. I wasn't. Even though I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, I have read all the books. Try me. I wasn't actually looking forward to the game. Um, it wasn't something that I was holding my breath for. But if you were, um, maybe watch the movies again. Anyway, Amazon is supposed to be doing a series on Lord of the Rings. So you have at least that to look forward to. So that is all for this episode. It's a little bit long because we had some of the longer stories. But you know what? The sun is shining. Spring is here. It's essentially summer in some regions. So enjoy yourself. Take a moment to breathe. It is amazing what sunshine can do for your spirit. Smile at someone random. Do a random act of kindness. Make someone's day. And just spread a little love and hope and just cheer. God knows we all need a little bit of that these days. With that being said, have yourselves a fantastic, fantastic week. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in every week for a new episode. Overlooked is a Tunica Media production, which also includes shows like Africa in My Kitchen, with more on the way. So follow Tunica Media on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to be in the loop. Until next time, have yourself a great week ahead.